My name is Ian Stocks. I'm a taxonomic entomologist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, the groups that I'm responsible for are the, the scales, mealybugs and their relatives, and the allorotidae, which are the white flies. In this part of the presentation on Cocoidia, we'll discuss some of the economic issues and environmental impacts that the introduction of non-native Cocoidia species into a new environment may have. As you mentioned earlier, Cocoidia are obligate plant feeders. Uh, as such, they can be described as plant parasites, the analog for plants of things like ticks and lice for, uh, for uh, animals. Generally speaking, they are small. There are only a few groups where the adult stage is in excess of 10 millimeters. And by far, the vast majority, um, as, even as an adult uh, stage, are less than 5 millimeters. Also, many of them are cryptic in that their body color or shape or some kind of cover that they create obscures or otherwise conceals the insect on the host. They can also be hidden within the host uh, where they're attached to a part of the plant that is hard to observe, such as under bark, in crevices of bark, on roots, or under leaf sheaths, especially of things like grasses. Overall, these uh, kind of act together to make this one of the most easily transported groups of insects uh, in international plant trade. And unfortunately, it may take just a single specimen to establish a new infestation. For instance, a single mated adult female, or in the cases when they're parthenogenetic, just the one female, uh, may be sufficient to get that population established. Generally, also, they will arrive in a new region already on a suitable host because it was the plant that was being uh, shipped around, and therefore they're able to disperse after introduction. So what are some of the consequences of an introduction into a novel habitat? Uh, well, they are going to experience new floras, and they are likely to encounter a suitable plant because many species are oligophagous or uh, flat-out polygophagous. So there's at least a few species up to many species of plants um, that they uh, will find suitable for uh, completing a life cycle. Also generally there will be an absence of the beneficial insects. These are the appropriate predators, pathogens, and parasitoids that in their natural uh, environment help to maintain the populations um, to a certain level. Also, they may have a very rapid generation time, especially if they get established in places like greenhouses or tropical climates like Florida, Texas, California, Hawaii. And in these circumstances, many generations per year are possible because of the climate. Their feeding activity reduces plant vigor, um, most prominently by the removal of water and photosynthates that the plant produces, especially the sugars. Uh, they uh, are also implicated in pathogen transmission, uh, though not to the extent that white flies and aphids are. Uh, they also excrete the excess uh, sugar-rich liquid as a waste product called honeydew, and when this fouls the plant, that leads to sooty mold. Uh, they can also directly injure the plant by uh, injecting toxins uh, within their saliva, and this may cause galling, pitting, or systemic toxicity to the plant. So now we'll discuss some of the regulatory difficulties, um, uh, especially when it comes to interdiction and identification. Unfortunately, regulatory activities cannot catch everything. The amount of trade is just uh, too large. The main agency responsible for uh, regulating the international trade in the United States of uh, plant materials is the USDA, which operates the port inspection and interdiction facilities. But they can really only process about 2% of the volume. This leaves then the state regulatory structures to try uh, fill the gap, so to speak, for ensuring that um, infested plant material does not get distributed around the United States. In Florida, we have the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and California has uh, similar agencies, as do uh, Hawaii and Texas. Uh, we also operate things called Cooperative Agricultural Pest Surveys, or CAPS programs. Um, we have one in Florida right now that is specifically involved in interstate inspection and interdiction. There are some very practical limitations to uh, interdiction efforts, either at the federal or state level. One is just plain smuggling, the illicit trade in plants. The other is uh, what we might think of as the informal trade of plant and plant materials, especially by hobbyist groups that form uh, 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 kind of collector societies around groups of plants like palms, cycads, bamboos, and others, 
when they trade material, they very often trade the pests. There's also personal and commercial interstate travel. And governing all of this is a patchwork of state regulations that don't always uh, work together uh, seamlessly. An example of problems specific to Florida would be vacation boaters to the Caribbean that visit uh, an island there uh, and bring plant material back on their private craft. And also cruise ships uh, that are so large that they contain what amount to inside floating jungles of plant material. In terms of identification, some of the problems are that um, in almost all cases, the determination requires a slide-mounted specimen. This is a time-consuming process, usually involving an hour or more. Uh, it, makes, it has many steps involved in the process, requiring special chemicals and tools. And uh, last but not least is, a, is a, a, a fair amount of skill in making a slide that is suitable for identification. Also, the description and diagnosis and keys almost always emphasize the adult female. So if the sample contains adult males or immature <laughs> stages only, it's very unlikely you'll be able to get a species ID um, for that pest. Also, there are changes in taxonomy that occur all the time that can confuse the issues of, of getting a good termination. Um, for instance, there's the uh, problem of synonyms, which is which name to use for a given uh, specimen. For instance, the common brown soft scale, Coccus hesperidum, was described by Linnaeus in 1758. Um, but from that time until 1950, different authors had used over 40 different names, um, placed them in seven different genera to refer to just the same thing. Also, new species are being described all the time. For instance, a fairly recent description of an armored scale that's a potential pest of avocado production, uh, the species Abgrolaspis aguacati, when it was first discovered was undescribed, um, but it did pose a potential problem for trade in avocados between the United States and Mexico. And not having a name um, caused a little bit of uh, problems for uh, uh, devising uh, a regulatory uh, a regulatory response. Also, there is no such thing as a regional fauna. The specimen that you have in front of you, in theory, could have originated nearly anywhere in the world. Um, we are trading species around the globe um, uh, at an at a ever-increasing rate. Also, many groups lack a comprehensive treatment, which usually means that uh, getting an ID requires access to fairly specialized literature. Also, field IDs are not reliable to species level. Um, they uh, are a number of things that you can look at for a field ID um, to help narrow down the possibilities or, or get a start on the ID, such as the shape of the female, the shape of the male pupa, the shape of any cover or test that it makes, uh, what host species the, uh, the, the insect was found on, and in fact even the location on a given host might be useful. As an example in a limitation of knowledge with which we're sometimes faced given um, identifying pest species, um, I'm giving you the example here of a, a mealybug uh, that was both recently described and recently um, discovered as an adventive species in Florida. In 2007, uh, Phenococcus multicerari, a mealybug, um, was described uh, from South America. The original description was based on just a few specimens that were in a vial that had been in a museum for over 50 years. And in such circumstances, we have almost no information about the hosts or potential host range. Of course, there's going to be no information about parasitoids, predators, or pathogens. So in short, there's almost nothing known about the biology and ecology of this new species. Uh, and so the impact will be, um, any economic impact will be um, poorly known. But in 2011, this species showed up um, uh, in Florida and it's now been collected several times. So almost all of the information that we have about this species is information that's been collected from specimens and populations collected in Florida. And unfortunately, this species belongs to a genus that's distributed worldwide and contains many pest species. So this is a species that we're uh, paying close attention to here in Florida. The next few slides uh, list by group a number of identification resources that are essential for um, getting identifications uh, in those groups. And the last slide is a list of the, num uh, the numerous collaborators uh, that work together to develop this training program. And at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. If a scale species from Costa Rica gets into Florida, 
why would people involved in agriculture or horticultural production in a remote place like Minnesota care? Um, well, that's a, that's a good question um, because you know if you think that perhaps the uh, the origin of the species in concern um, was somewhere maybe like a uh, a neotropical uh, forest, for instance, and it was introduced into Florida, got established there. What's the likelihood that it would become a problem to some kind of uh, agricultural endeavor in Minnesota or somewhere else? Um, the point is, is that we we really just never know. In many cases, the the full picture of a biology of, of a species that we would consider to be adventive is, is not known for quite some time. Another potential reason why uh, people more generally should be con uh, concerned about an adventive species, say in South Florida, um, is that uh, some of these groups actually can carry diseases. Um, and when they feed on plants, they can transmit those diseases to plants. Other insects can pick them up, and then they can be uh, transmitted into other plant species that perhaps are more widely distributed. So even though the insect itself may pose, um, in the abstract, no particular risk to agriculture in a, in a, in a much more temperate uh, environment, um, it can maybe bring some collateral problems with it that are um, uh, more, more unknown. Why is the taxonomy of scale insects restricted almost entirely to adult females? That's one of the drawbacks, perhaps, of, of the current state of taxonomy for Cocoidea, is we're more or less limited um, to one stage, the adult female. So all of the immature stages and the male stage um, uh, really don't figure into species level ID. Um, the practical sort of reason that that might be the case is because the adult female is, is, is very often the one you encounter the most and is, is most readily observed. Crawlers can be quite small. The males are typically quite small and they're presence uh, is ephemeral even when they do exist. Um, so the practical aspects of, of, of taxonomy have just gradually been built up over the years with the females. And also, by and large, in terms of the contrast between the immature stages and adult female, the adult female is the one that expresses the full suite of characters um, that, that will be developed. Of course, the other option, of course, is the, um, the adult male. The adult males are incredibly character rich. Um, but for the purposes of practical taxonomy, they're very difficult to deal with. They're less commonly encountered, um, but they have not been ignored. The, the, the crawler, the immature stages, and the adult male stage in particular have figured in um, uh, significantly in our understanding of the relationships amongst the different groups of scale insects, even though they're not used routinely for species level ID. I have two questions. Uh, how common is it is for scale or mealybugs to kill a host plant? And is it, is it not bad for a parasite to kill the host? Yeah, this, uh, the, the, the interaction of the, of, of the parasite, which is effectively what these, uh, these insects are, and its host, the plant, um, is, is similar to that of, of uh, say, uh, ticks or, or lice. On a, on a vertebrate host. The idea is that they will be able to sustain over the long term populations on that host without debilitating it to the point that it crashes, dies, uh, uh, whatever, because that would be obviously bad for the long term survival of the population. Probably in most instances in the kind of natural uh, setting where these uh, organisms originate, they have evolved uh, over, over time interactions with their host, the predators, the parasitoids, they keep them sufficiently in check that they don't overwhelm their host. Um, but when they are introduced into a new environment, uh, so when they become adventive, uh, very often they might uh, find that there's a plant that's suitable for them. But that plant has no innate ability to deal with them. Um, uh, the predators and parasitoids may be absent from the environment. So in a sense, there's really nothing to check them from exploding to the point that they just simply overwhelm their host. And it is not uncommon for mealybugs, scales, aphids, and all of those relatives, in some cases, to be able to kill the host that they're on. So what are some factors that uh, influence whether an adventive scale insect will become a pest in the new area? Well, when, a, when, a, when an organism is considered to be adventive, uh, what we're meaning is that uh, we believe it to be native uh, to uh, another kind of uh, environment, another ecosystem. So when it shows up in a new one, for instance, say South Florida, it's typically going to do so um, in the absence of, of all of the predators and parasitoids and all of the other ecological interactions, uh, pathogens such as 
viruses, bacteria, uh, fungi, uh, that all help to, in a sense, control population growth in that natural environment. So if they're absent in the new environment, uh, then they can really uh, um, uh, explode in population size.